that. Uh, to highlight that, I thought we could mention uh, the most interesting or the most recent, your choice, wildlife we saw in parks. And if you want bonus points, um, mention two, two different species of wildlife. Um, and thinking about the, uh, in the same vein as sort of the centaur uh, themed <laughs> animals, if they merged into one, what would they become? So as an example, I regularly see squirrels and crows on my walk here in my neighborhood park. So if they merged into one, they would be uh, probably the front would probably be the crow I'm guessing and would hopefully have wings. <clears throat> or maybe it would have a front of a squirrel and, and, and it, would, it would fly, I don't know. So you get the idea. So um, I'm gonna go in the order of my Zoom. Um, I'm gonna go with Tim. Oh. Caught me, mal caught me multitasking. Um, Sorry. Well, mine's not gonna be very different than yours. I recently was driving by Westmoreland Park and saw a little skinny coyote. Um, and then also was over at the Sandy River with the dog and saw a bald eagle. So I'll just give that little coyote a beak and some wings and, and call it good. Thank you, Tim. So so I can track keep track of people. I'll just go ahead and call everybody. Um, Brooke. Well, <clears throat> I think bald eagle is probably the most impressive wildlife I've seen at, at a park. Um, and I've also seen turtles at, at the pond in Laurelhurst. So I'm going to do eagle turtle combo. <laughs> to be the shell, I think. And the bald eagle head seems appropriate. So, but maybe some wings too. Thank you. Paul. All right. Well, squirrels seem to be a common denominator here. So I've seen squirrels recently in Wilshire Park. And we were recently at um, Wild Horse Island at Flathead Lake where I saw bighorn sheep. So the head of this creature has the horns of a bighorn sheep and the tail of a fluffy squirrel. <laughs> Thank you. Casey. So there is an osprey hanging out at uh, um, Ross Island, um, which is there daily. It's lovely to see. Um, and then I was seeing some white-breasted nuthatches up in the Caddam, on the Caddam Trail. And I think the combination may not be um, viable as a flying object. <laughs> That's okay. Viability was not a requirement of this assignment. Alana, what have you got for us? Uh, I recently took my kid kayaking, putting into the slough at Whitaker Ponds. And as we walked down, we saw the ducklings in the pond and then in the slough saw a great blue heron. So I am picturing a very fuzzy, adorable duckling fur on something the size of a heron right now. I like it. David, what have you got? Can you guys hear me? Good. Um, let's see, my, my, uh, my animals would be, recently I was actually attacked by an owl on my ride into work one morning. It was, you know, pitch black, oh, dark 30. And um, sure, sure enough, I, something was scratching at the top of my helmet. And before I knew it, there was this three and a half foot wingspan owl, like right in front of me with its talons, like hanging out in front of my in front of my visor and then I see deer all the time on the spring water corridor heading into work so it would be a drowl a deer and an owl thank you David you even had a name for yours I appreciate that yeah. Ad Adina what are you thinking so um I recently saw a beaver um at a park um which was it was exciting um because I got a pretty up close view and actually this morning I had to slam on my brakes for a doe and two of her fawns crossing the street right near a natural area. Um, so I'm thinking a beaver, the size of a deer with the long legs, the face 
of the beaver and a deer tail. And I don't have a name for it, but it sounds really scary to me. <laughs> and clearly very industrious, like the beaver, I'm imagining. So how about Corbin? If you, uh, what wildlife have you seen? And bonus points if you can merge two forms of wildlife. I have the same one as you, Bonnie, like crows, crows and squirrels right now. So I, I kind of want to see a, a flying squirrel with uh, some black wings. I think that would look a little cool. Terrific. Thank you. Ellie. Yeah, uh, I at Crystal Springs saw some uh, wood ducklings and a brown creeper. So I'm thinking of a wood duckling sized thing creeping up and with its big bill trying to get little insects and having a really hard time. Thank you. Mike. Uh, well, I see a, a, a barred owl pretty regularly in the Arboretum in this one in the same spot actually all the time. And then um, see brush rabbits on the same trail quite a bit. So I guess mine would be a flying rabbit, which would pretty much make my garden impossible to defend. I guess you found that barred owl's uh, hanging out spot. Um, Aaron, what have you seen? Okay, I've seen a, well, I've seen a lot of things that other people have seen, um, but what comes to my mind is, like David said, deer at spring water corridor. So it's cute to see them. And then um, a blue heron, great blue heron at um, Westmoreland Park. Um, so those guys together making something. <laughs> Thank you. Adrian, what have you seen lately, wildlife in the park? Uh, let's see. Well, it wasn't Portland, but uh, coming down uh, off of the Lauas, we were absolutely roasting and stopped at just a little creek and cooled down and saw a marten. So that was the first time I've ever seen one of those. Um, and let's see, off of the Fremont Bridge, Peregrine Falcon, so let's see, what would that be? Um, if a peregrine fal falcon had a marten mask, uh, maybe a paramartin. <laughs> well, that's a good name. Thank you. Randy, what wildlife have you seen that you want to merge? Uh, well, I'm going to take us in a little different direction. I uh, witnessed some wildlife in Laurelhurst Park last night, um, as Shakespeare would say the double back beast in action. Um, and uh, uh, it was late evening and, and we'll just have to check back in maybe in nine months and see what it merged. Okay, thank you, Randy. Um, Patty. Patty, you're still muted. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, I, well, I um, I have not been in a park lately, but I've been si uh, sitting in my garden reading. And when I'm very still, um, the birds come extraordinarily close and they come just to check me out, I think. And so um, my, I've got a trio of a hummingbird, a chickadee and song sparrow. So I'm not quite sure how they merge. They merge perhaps as a, a singing, humming chickadee. I don't know. Lovely, thank you. Lorena, what wildlife have you seen in the parks and can you merge them? I uh, spend a lot of time in the learning garden. So I like to see a bunch of bugs like different beetles and uh, dragonflies and bumblebees, different types of bees. So I'm, I like the bug white life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Todd, how about you? My merged animal is a beagle, a beaver at Harold Heights Park, and an eagle at, uh, at uh, Oak Spot. The beagle. I think that name is already taken, but that's OK. Um, Alejandro, what wildlife have you seen, and can you merge them? Oops, Alejandro, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, we can. Better? 
Yes. Sure. I've seen a pellated uh, good pepper and a few banana slugs. So I'm thinking of a, either a banana pecker or a good slug, whatever you guys want to call it. I'm not sure which way would go and what would be less scary. Or you want to see one of those flying or you want to see a banana slug with a huge peak knocking on the on, on a tree? Well, are we sure we want to see any of those, Alejandro? But thank you for the for the visual. <laughs> Jen, what have you got? Well, we have a local possum in our neighborhood, famous possum. Everyone's always talking about the possum. And at Arbor Lodge Park recently, I was watching two very small hummingbirds. I wondered if they were maybe calliope hummingbirds, the smallest, who were kind of tussling it out. You know how fast they are and how slow possums seem to be and they kind of trundle. So I'm thinking it's a, a humming possum that has wings and flies as fast and as angular action as a hummingbird. That would be cool. Nice, the speed of the hummingbird. I love it. Uh, Lauren. So similar to Jen, I saw a great blue heron on the Willamette uh, this weekend and also a nutria in Errol Heights Park. And so I think it'd be a great blue nutria. <laughs> which is not a pretty picture actually probably <laughs> yes i think in general some of these visuals are pretty interesting thank you lauren sabrina what wildlife have you seen in the parks lately and can you merge them um i haven't seen much wildlife in the parks that i've been to but i was driving through happy valley and saw like five deer running around. And so um, that was pretty cool. I kept stopping my car. Um, so I can't merge it and it wasn't in a park, but it is wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maximo. <clears throat> I, um, I think mine has been mentioned already, but uh, a bald eagle and a squirrel um, I saw actually out at PIR which is a racetrack, but it's also a very large uh, city park. Um, when I think of combining the two, I don't know why I think of just thinking of the, the eagle head and the squirrel body, um, but uh, I think of them in proportion, so I'm not sure how functional um, it is <laughs> as an animal, but that's what I picture. Thank you. Functionality is not a requirement of the assignment. Uh, let's see, uh, Kenya, what have you got? Um, let's see, I saw a, a male western tanager in Marshall Park, and uh, I saw people riding horses in, um, in Tryon Creek, so I'm going to merge a uh, western tanager with a horse, and I'm going to call it a tanager e. Ferris. <laughs> Thank you, Kenya. Um, and Margaret, I know you just signed in, but what we're, um, we're sharing what wildlife we've recently seen. Um, and for bonus points, we're merging two or more together. Um, and some people even have names, but you don't need the, if you don't need extra credit, you don't have to go that far. Yeah, I don't know if I'll get the extra credit. Um, so I saw an owl recently, which really surprised me because I hear them a lot when I'm out in the natural areas, but I don't often see them. Um, but then that counteracted the fact that I saw a snake that went right in front of me, which made me scream and run. And so I don't know what you would do with a flying snake. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Did I miss anyone? There was some movement of my squares while we were doing that. I think I got everybody. Um, Okay, let's get started with um, any comments to the agenda that we have. We have a couple of last minute changes due to illnesses. Um, Todd is going to fill in for Victor, who is filling in for Vicente on the um, extreme heat protocols and safety training. Um, and my understanding is that Kendra um, is sick. Um, and so, and, and I understand Laura was not comfortable filling in for her portion for the fire risk. So any comments to the agenda? 
So it sounds like we have a little bit of extra time. So if our other items go over time, we can take the fire risk, um, the time that was allocated for that. Any comments to the agenda? Any changes? Okay. With that, um, let's move to approving the July minutes, um, which Brooke sent out last week. I hope everybody had a chance to review them. Um, if you had any comments, if you got them to Brooke, Brooke, I had just a couple of little comments that I sent you this morning, um, a, a typo, and then just adding some of the information that you just said was provided, but wasn't actually provided in the notes. Um, did anyone else have any other comments? I would if move not, approve. I would move approval as you have amended. Thank you, Patty. Um, is there a second? Second. I see Adrian's hand. Sorry, Ali. I see Adrian's hand, Brooke, for the second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, op Aye. Any opposition? Aye. Okay, minutes are approved. Um, so with that, let's go into the director's report. Um, Director Long, I know provided the monthly report that Brooke sent out um, a few days ago. I hope everybody had a chance to review that. Um, and um, Director Long, would you like to give a brief amended version? And I know, I know some people have some questions on the report as well, so. Go ahead. But what I was going to do today was um, actually just give an update on Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland, because we're chugging along. Um, and um, hopefully you all will um, get some time to read the report. And then when I'm done, if um, we, we can, um, we can uh, take any questions you all have about um, items in the report as well. Um, so uh, as you recall, uh, Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland um, framework calls for assembling the four work teams. So two are currently active, the listening and learning team and the decision support tool team. And since the last time uh, we met, the listening and learning team has held workshops with East Portland leaders, uh, leaders from the immigrant and refugee community and Home Forward. We're really excited to be exploring a partnership with Coalition of Communities of Color and we expect to continue to meet with them and discuss how to best structure what that partnership looks like um, in September. Uh, the listening and learning team is now going to begin work analyzing and synthesizing data from completed community listening workshops. The team will integrate past listening also into this work so that we can represent what we've already been hearing. Uh, this will likely include the 2017 community needs survey, outreach from our level of service studies, uh, tree planting strategy work, and information we received from the sustainable future work sessions that we held in uh, the fall of 2019. So the community, all of that listening information will inform the work of our other teams. So the decision support tool team um, also created a prototype tool that we are actually piloting in the fall bump budgeting process. So we were really excited that the tool was also able to integrate uh, the racial equity lens that was created by Kenya and his team. So after the fall bump, uh, the decision support tool team will evaluate the pilot and revise the tool for use in fiscal year 22-23 requested budget that happens in January. Um, we're going to be kicking off two additional teams as well, the vision, mission, values, and racial equity statement team, and the actions and results team. Um, and as we've stated previously, we're hoping to have a representative from the board um, for each of those teams. Uh, the vision, mission, values, and racial equity statement team, which um, we have been affectionately referring to as MOVER or MVVR, will conduct their work in uh, September and October. Uh, the team will look at our current bureau statements, consider feedback from community listening, and then create new drafts of our statements. This will happen over a series of five workshops three of which will include representatives from our co-design stakeholders, which includes the Parks Board, uh, Urban Forestry Commission, community-based organizations, culturally specific organizations, um, and, and more. Uh, these new statement drafts will then go back to the community for another wave of listening. Uh, the MVVR team will reconvene in late January or early February to consider community listening and then create a final mission, vision, values, 
and racial equity statements for the Bureau. So um, for actions and results, the, second, the fourth of the four teams, <clears throat> an internal prep team is now working on an actions and results framework that will allow us to map all of the Bureau's uh, outcomes, services, uh, performance metrics, targets, actions, and results. This is something we've never done before, and we know that we'll have a lot of gaps, especially when it comes to tying the actions to actual results using data and performance metrics. Once we've completed the mapping of our current state of actions and results, our uh, SMT, our senior management team, will spend time um, together filling in um, existing gaps. And in October, we will then convene a co-design team, like the one that we're convening for MVVR, to review our work and help us prioritize uh, based on community input. So we see that work happening in uh, two to three workshops in October and early November. Once we've identified our framework gaps and prioritized our work for the next year, we see that actions and results will most likely be organized by work streams. For example, urban forestry or reducing barriers to access and recreation. At that time, we will identify the best way to manage work teams with a balance of internal and external stakeholders. We know that the actions and result work is what will drive the next few years of community listening. It will take us a while to create a strong performance-based framework that links resource allocation to services and outcomes. And we wanna get regular input from the community to make sure we're meeting the needs that we've stated we are centering in Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland. Again, as I mentioned, um, I'm hopeful that a representative from the Parks Board will serve on each of these two teams. Uh, we'll follow up next week with an email outlining the expected time commitments um, so that folks can make um, an informed decision about how they'd like to participate. Um, so that's my report on Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland, which, like I said, is some of the most important work that we're doing. Um, but I know that everyone received the, uh, the monthly report, which Brooke, bless her heart, edits to about half of its size, believe it or not. Um, and so I know that there were some questions about some of the items in that report. And also, if there's any questions about HP, HP, hit me. Thank you, Director Long. Um, I just had a clarifying question. The request um, went out just, I, don't, I, I haven't even had a chance to look at it myself. I don't know if anybody really has. Um, on the two teams that are looking for board members at this time, um, the metrics and the mission, vision, values teams. Um, and you said that it sounds like so, that work is getting underway September, October-ish. So when do you want to have, ideally, when would you like to have board members and other members um, in place so that people can just, because again, we haven't gotten the full information in terms of what the commitment is yet. Um, I would say that for the for the workshops, that, I mean, for the, for the um, work teams that are starting in September and October, certainly by, the, by mid to the end of August. Um, Tim, does that sound right or Kenya? Okay, but I'm sorry, so did I misunderstand? We're still getting the information on what the time commitment is gonna be. And Correct. It's, okay, so basically you need to know right away if people can do it. For that one, uh, the sooner the better. Okay. The other one is, is gonna be a little bit later. Which one is later again? Sorry. <laughs> um, I believe it's the MVVR is starting sooner and then action results is starting. Okay, Super so the after, which right. makes um, <laughs> it does. First. Okay, um, but and and the decision support tool team has been going, and are they at this point? Are they? Is there work on pause while the decision support tool um, is field tested, or what's yeah. going on? With it? Yeah, we're practicing using the tool now in a pilot and then we'll do kind of like a hot wash and then we'll get together uh, with Casey and J.R. Lilly and the whole team again, kind of debrief that and then retool for pilot version two. And that will be happening this fall. We hope to use it for the you know November 
December timeframe as we characterize our budget request. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from anyone else regarding- I see Paul have their hands up. Oh, I don't see hands. What am I missing? Paul, who, whoever has their hands up, Casey. I see, Ka oh, I see Casey, Paul. Oh gosh, I'm missing everybody. Okay, go ahead. I don't so know who's first. I've got a question to pitch. Um, uh, my question um, is, are you, do you think you're still on track to get a draft revised mission statement to us by the end of September? Is that looking about right or do you think that's changing? For the first wave. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, great, good. And then my pitch is having been on the decision support tool team, I just want to make a pitch that other people seriously think about joining other teams. I, it wasn't that much of a time commitment. And I found out a lot more about parks and park personnel. Uh, and I thought overall, the experience was very beneficial. So I would encourage everybody to, to join one of the teams. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Um, I see Aaron and Paul's hands up. I'm not sure who. Let's go with Aaron. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks to Adina and Brooke for the excellent director's report. There's obviously a lot going on. One thing that I was curious about that wasn't mentioned was the recent vandalism to the York sculpture in Mount Tabor Park. So if you could fill us in a little bit on that, I'd be really interested. Sure. Um, so yeah, it was uh, vandalized again, uh, maybe a week and a half ago. I don't remember the exact date, sorry. Um, it was removed. It's in an undisclosed location. Um, it's not likely to be repaired and replaced. And we're working with RAC, who's receiving a lot of um, feedback about uh, whether or not uh, there should be a permanent statue of York, whether or not it should be at Tabor Park. Um, and, um, and we're, you know, tangentially involved in that conversation um, because uh, because they're looking at parks as the place for that type of public art. Um, but yeah, so a lot of it also, um, you know, has to do with the artist who has asked to remain anonymous. So, um, so it's an interesting dynamic for us. So I hope that's helpful. And there's a lot of um, sort of lovely, but probably not going to stay for too long memorials at the space where the statue was, um, just sort of in support of it, of it, so. Thank you. Um, Aaron, is your, your hand is no longer up. Did you? Yeah, put I put it, it in the chat. Although um, from the report, I did read that Willamette Week article, or was it Willamette Week, about the pickleball in Selwood Park. And I think it'd be, if there's time, good to just get a little more information about, about that. Because I'm sure there's more information than what was just in the article. Yeah, um, so that group had been working with parks um, and advocating for the courts to be converted into pickleball. And um, we were under discussions with them. Um, and uh, unfortunately they went ahead and made modifications without our approval. Um, even though we had advised them that we were doing a um, tennis court study uh, that would identify courts that would likely be decommissioned or uh, could be um, adaptively reused for other um, sports. And that did include Selwood. Um, and unfortunately, they went ahead without our permission. So, yeah. And so we had to ask them to stop. So, Adina, can I get clarification? It the article did make it sound like one of the staff, park staff, did provide them access. So was that? I interviewed all just... the staff that have been, um, who've been, uh, or I've had managers interview the staff that were involved and that is not the case. They, I believe that they were, um, they were not given access. Um, I mean, they painted a mural, they were starting to do thousands of dollars worth of, of work and, and it was not approved. 
So. And I'll invite any of my managers who are involved in that to share any other information that I might not have shared. Thank you for well, that update. I don't know if Lauren's gonna jump in, but the um, public comment for the court study, I believe is open till September 7th. So if you're interested in commenting on the future of public tennis courts, that's an opportunity. And I think when that clue concludes, then we'll have a lot more information, make some decisions about which courts are best for new uses. Yeah, thanks, Todd. So the only thing I'll add to that is that um, just a reminder, we had gone through all the tennis courts in the whole system, both internally and with um, now we're out in the public to talk about what other uses they would like. And if those courts are in really bad shape in Solid Park and have been for a really long time. And so it's likely they'll get repurposed in some form or fashion. Um, and we are working, they have a non use permit in that, that group um, into our property management group. And so we just have that on hold until we have them participate in the, in the discussion, in the public discussion. Does that help? Thank you, Lauren. I see Maximo took himself off video too. He might have something to add because tennis courts are under his purview. Yeah, um, thank you. And I can just add for just pickleball um, usage, um, we have been and continue to be exploring opportunities for this uh, increasing um, in usage and popularity sport. We do have uh, lines dedicated on tennis courts um, at Gabriel Park, as well as Columbia Park. And we, are, we do have plans to add them as well to courts at the Portland Tennis Center. Um, and we are also working to make sure that our staff um, who are certified in tennis instruction are also getting certified in uh, pickleball instruction as well too. So we're um, continuing to explore opportunities to um, incorporate this into our overall programming uh, in the future. Thank you for the update, both operationally. Um, I. I have a question though, with respect to, since that was a misunderstanding of the person reporting in the article, um, is there gonna be any effort on the Bureau's part to at least clarify, you know, what is going on with the um, tennis court evaluation process? Um, the fact that, you know, pickleball is supported and that, you know, that, the Bureau definitely um, invites um, volunteerism, but that there's a process by which that happens. Um, yeah, sure. Um, we, we've actually written um, and communicated and corresponded with this group. Um, and I'm sure that Tim gave all of that information to the newspapers. But as you know, they choose to, um, to print what they choose to print. And I see his hands up, so he's probably gonna to speak to that as well. But yeah, we've, we've definitely corresponded with this group um, uh, as well as others who've advocated on behalf of this group that there is a process and that we love pickleball and we, we love volunteerism and we love philanthropy, <laughs> but, um, but we can't just have people um, you know, unilaterally make decisions about um, modifying our parks, park places, so. We're having this problem across the board. We've got rogue skate parks that are being built as well. And it's, it's a real problem. Tim? Yeah, Bonnie and the rest of the board, we had many conversations with Willamette Week and the reporter about this um, specific story. We offered lots of information about the process and how we engage. We shared information around um, the purported um, you know, agreement between staff um, and the pickleball enthusiasts and gave our side of the story. Um, so we were in long conversations. Um, even though we had long conversations, for those of you who may have gotten the print edition, you'll also have recognized an inaccuracy where they referenced um, the operational levy as a way to be able to address some of these maintenance issues. So even though we were having long conversations, 
when it came to um, talking about um, the levy, they did not ask those questions um, and they printed something that was completely inaccurate, um, which then led to longer conversations. Um, they eventually changed the dig digital version and printed a correction in the next print edition. So just call that to everyone's attention if they had noticed it on their own. Yeah, thank you. I do think it's really important that, I mean, and I get 100% Tim that it's it's a huge job um, and I appreciate, I appreciate that, but I do think it's important that we stay on those um, kinds of things because again, the, the relationship that you have with that advocacy group is important. And of course with Willamette Week, but you know, all the readers are reading what they're reading and then what their perception is, is that right hand doesn't know what the left hand is. And, and um, it's, it's something that's problematic um, and something that, you know, we need to continue. And by we, I mean you um, uh, to, to address. So thank yeah. you. No, no, it's no problem. We work really hard to make sure that we are providing accurate and timely information to reporters and constituents. Um, when it comes down to a he said, she said kind of situation, though, the editor of the Willamette Week um, gets to make the call on what they decide to print. So we did advocate that we believe that that is inaccurate, um, as well as a few other points within the story. Um, and, you know, we have story, we have conversations with reporters and editors in almost every scenario where there's a story coming out about us. Um, in this case, they did not decide to make those digital edits. So well aware that their readership is um, broad and vast and that making sure that we get things right is really important. So um, completely agree with you, Bonnie. Yeah. Um, and, to Tim, and to Tim's credit, he really went to the mat with um, these uh, reporters to, to um, get them to make a correction um, because it was so egregious that, and this you know, newspaper in particular had covered the parts levy for months, right? So like, they had in their, in their, you know, in their history, facts about the parks levy, and then they, and then they still reported um, inaccurately. Um, any more questions for Adina on the either Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland, or her director's report? Um, because Adina, I actually, if you don't mind, I actually wanted to talk a Corbin little bit. Corbin has more. her hand up still, Bonnie. Oh, Corbin, I didn't see your hand. My apologies. Go ahead. No problem. But uh, let me know if this is not the right place to ask this question. Um, we're looking at you know, triple digits in the next three days. And I was wondering how um, is how our parks are um, preparing for that? It's actually an agenda item later on in the meeting. So we'll be covering oh, it quite perfect. thoroughly. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank yeah, th thank you, Corbin. That was the uh, extreme heat report that we we're going to get from Vicente, um, but Todd's going to be covering that. Thank you. Um, so I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about the various media reports um, because there's been a lot of them. Um, and I guess I wanted to just kind of think about, um, you know, the issues related to uh, the environmental impacts of the of the um, urban camps um, and, and you know, issues related to the South Park blocks and whatnot. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, Tim, I recognize the, uh, the uphill battle you have there, um, but are we also thinking about ways that parks can either through, you know, letters that, that you know, are submitted under Adina's signature, for example, um, to get records straight about information because, you know, I hear a lot of, oh, that's, that's incorrect, that's misinformation. Um, and, you know, how can we get better in front of those issues? Um, so something to think about, um, something that's been concerning to me, um, and maybe it's not a question that we can answer right now, but I wanted to kind of mention it. Um, and feeding into that also is um, a letter that went out and I think Jen stepped away, I don't know if she still stepped away, that went out, um, Friends of Trees issued, which apparently was also based on a complete misunderstanding of their um, um, issues related to their tree planting, um, how they were only focusing on 
because of the BES funding on private street tree or private trees as opposed to street trees. Um, but again, I think Jen may, maybe stepped away and can't um, address that. That came in through um, Friends of Trees and, and, and but went out to their whole mailing list is my understanding. Yeah, I'm happy to respond. To a Go ahead, Director. No, I was just going to say that um, I've composed a letter um, in response to that misinformation um, that uh, ought to be going out soon, and the entire board will be copied on it. Um, and I've and it, and it gently asks for them to make corrections to their stakeholders, who are our stakeholders as well. Yeah. Um, thank you, Director Long. You know we have been. Um, in the media a lot um, in my tenure with the Bureau. Um, you know, just want to remind the group that we have a public information officer um, is our communications capacity currently. So we respond and work incredibly hard to get accurate information out. And then we need to pick and choose our battles when we net go out to correct information. Um, we are building a larger communications team that will be supportive my dog's dreaming. And so if you hear any groaning behind, that's him, not me. Um, and so we will be recruiting a communications manager as well as a communications coordinator to continue to support our responsiveness to media and to public records requests, as well as to be more proactive um, as we're doing work in the community so that we are um, getting facts out there um, ahead of time and then throughout the process as we work with partners, as we work with the media, um, and the commissioner's office. And um, I'll just highlight that Sabrina's got her hand up. Thanks, thanks, Tim. And yes, Sabrina, I see your hand up. Thank you both. Um, I have a question kind of going in a different direction. So I'm not sure if um, the media conversation has concluded because I have a different question. Um, yeah, I think you know, in terms of we can't conclude that conversation here, but Tim has provided us an update with, um, you know, what staff is doing to move it forward. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll say yes, please, please feel free to ask whatever question, if it is topical on the director's report. Yeah, I had a question. So I see um, in a few different areas, such as I think it was like urban forestry, um, the hiring that's been done. And then when I was going down to the, um, the section that talks more about hiring, I can't think of the term right now because I lost it, but um, it talks about the different outreach efforts that were done. And then it talks about a workforce development. And then it talks about um, the number of like applicants and the numbers of people who are being hired. And I'm curious, how do we get more information on who is being hired and that kind of employee profile? Um, I'm curious, is there a connection between the outreach efforts with, you know, NEA and SEI and Latino Network to who's actually being hired? Um, and, you know, where could we get more information on that? Thank you for yeah. that, Sabrina. Um, we we actually spoke about this um, at, at um, last the last month's meeting, um, and uh, Bonnie had requested a workforce development update um, regarding hiring. And I had mentioned that um, uh, Margaret and her team will be doing sort of an, an after uh, action uh, because we're still sort of in the middle of it, quite frankly. Um, and that she would be able to then, and also a best practices conversation about what didn't didn't work for our for our increased hiring uh, this time around. Um, and I believe that we were hoping to have that in our September meeting. But I'll I'll see if Margaret has anything to add. Yeah, uh, thank you, Adina, for covering that. Um, yes, we're tracking uh, employee information, candidates, who's applying, demographics, all of our. Um, outreach efforts. We're tracking that on an ongoing basis. We're anticipating September or October will really have the ramp up information um, that we'll be able to come back and, and report out before we start phase one in November. Um, but we, we are tracking that. And, and I thought I would continue to include, you know, just regular updates in the monthly report. Thanks. I, I have a clarifying question. You said there's a like a phase one in November. Maybe there's something that I 
missed. What do you mean by that? No, thank you. Uh, I forget sometimes internal terminology. Um, so uh, we right now we're really focusing on, on our summer hiring and the 55 positions um, of the regular ongoing positions. And so the timeline that we put together is that we would have our recruitment, our outreach recruitment selection efforts completed by the end of October so that we could then focus on um, the uh, future hiring that we would be doing to help support the levy. I was going to, I was going to even backtrack further for you, Sabrina, when we say ramp up, what this whole, like <laughs> this recruitment piece is about the levy, right? So we didn't have, we had um, very little seasonal summer hiring last year, right? Then we got we got a we got an interfund loan so that we could have recreation programming um, and seasonal uh, staff this summer. So we had to hire a lot of people in a, a, a relatively short amount of time after having been off for a year. So that was challenging in and of itself. Um, and of course, the folks who didn't want to work um, because of COVID. Now the ramp up is the 55 positions that we're hiring and what we're referring to as year zero of the levy because we've got that interfund loan. Year one starts November, right? That's when the, that's when the levy um, technically hits the books. So that's what she's talking about, phase one. So it's all in the context of the levy. Um, and so uh, I think that might've been the missing piece for you. So, um, so yeah, so in September, October, we're hoping to come, she's, uh, Margaret's gonna do a hot wash. We'll have all of the statistics and all of the data compiled and we'll have something to report out to the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, update on the workforce, um, especially since I was gonna also ask, because Margaret, one of the things that I'm interested in um, is in the report that you provided, which was terrific, thank you. Um, you know, you mentioned the, you know, over 3,000 applicants um, and the number of hires and you broke it down by dry side and aquatics and um, et cetera. Um, I guess one question that I was also thinking is, you know, in terms of um, the readiness of the applicants, um, you know, what is sort of normal. So based on the numbers that you provided, over 3,000 applicants and a little over 1,000 hires. So that means, you know, almost two-thirds of these people who applied for jobs, you know, weren't offered jobs. Um, you know, where are the skills gaps that those people have? I'm, I'm interested in learning more about that. And is that typical? Um, and how can we help those people who are interested in, in working for parks um, to gain the skills necessary if they don't have them. So uh, those are kinds of things that I'm also interested in um, for future reports. Um, Definitely, I can include that in future reports. And I'll just also say that we have quite a few people that declined positions. So just, just because somebody didn't receive a position doesn't mean that it was, wasn't offered. Um, we actually ran into that quite a bit um, and it was really surprising. Um, to have so many people decline everything from our seasonal maintenance workers to seasonal recreation. So, um, you know, there's a, a wide variety in the people that didn't receive a position in regards to, you know, I can provide further details in a future report, but we're working really closely with our community partners. We were very intentional with those partnerships. And part of uh, the work that we're doing is actually working with our community partners and potential candidates in how to apply with the city and workshops. And um, our community partners are providing uh, job readiness coaching um, from their own organizations. So uh, we have been uh, working through it. And like I said, I can, I can provide a lot more detail um, as we provide a future report. Yeah, thank you. I think that would be really helpful. And, um, you know, again, to unpack those issues, right? Like, so why are they declining? Are they, you know, offered other jobs in the meantime? You know, those kinds of questions, but thank you. Okay, with that, thank you for the very thorough report, Director Long, and, and all the support that you received from your um, staff to answer our many questions. Um, thanks, Tim, for all the work you do with media and Margaret on the workforce. Um, let's move into working group reports. As you can see, I'm trying to, I allowed us to absorb the, uh, the time that we had allocated for the fire risk. Hopefully we can still end on time. 
um, working group reports. Um, Erin, can you tell us what's going on with community engagement, please? Yeah, so we've been working to schedule a normal meeting time, um, which we now have. So our meeting time, our first meeting is going to be on August 19th, 10 a.m. So normal meeting time will be third Thursdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Um, and so right now, the amount of people on the working group slash interested, like some new members are interested in the working group would exceed quorum, but we're hoping that that probably won't be an issue because everybody's not necessarily going to be able to attend every month, but that's something we'll be looking out for and monitoring just so we don't run into that issue when we meet on Thursday. Um, that meeting will really be a meeting to uh, start the work of setting the work of the group since it hasn't, it's kind of like a new group in a lot of ways. Um, so that's what we'll be focusing on a little bit there. Um, Tim and Kenya are going to be our staff support, which I'm very excited about. And um, besides that, I thought I would just give a little mini update on um, the, I'm, I'm on the project advisory committee for Mill Park. So just a really quick update for people because they might be interested. We've had the um, advisory committee, Mill Park is a right now pretty, um, pretty much trees and grass, a large kind of parcel of land right next to Mill, um, Mill Park Elementary School on a near 122nd and Division. And um, I think the park was purchased some 35 years ago, but hasn't really been developed. Um, and so it's there's a process right now of developing the park. I joined the uh, project advisory committee and we've had two meetings so far, both on Zoom. Um, the last meeting uh, was just a few weeks ago and got input from the group. The design firm Meyer Reed was there. And one thing that I wanted to share that I thought was really interesting and I guess is somewhat new is that there's um, a local kind of artist and muralist on board named Alex Chu, who is um, helping from the get go to uh, um, kind of do uh, provide input and also he's going around and taking photos of the neighborhood, talking to people, doing a lot of outreach himself. Um, there's actually an Instagram account, which I'm gonna put in the chat. It's at Mill Park Stories. It's not PPR Instagram account, but it's part of his uh, work that he's doing where he's documenting some of the things that he's seeing in the neighborhood, which I thought was really interesting. There was a community gathering on August 3rd um, and the first hour was actually reserved for speakers of um, Arabic, Burmese, Nepali, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese speakers. And then the last, uh, the second hour was just open for everyone. So I thought I wanted to share that, found that interesting. Um, yeah, so that's a little update on that process. Uh, yeah, that's my update. Any, any questions or? Thank you, Erin. Yeah. Um, anything anyone else to add or any questions to Erin? And thank you for tossing in the mill plane update as well. Ani, <clears throat> I can just add that we also went to council and recently received approval to, um, to acquire a half an acre of prop, real property right on Southeast 122nd so that we could have better access to it. I'm sure Aaron's aware of that. And so we're pretty excited about that as well. We paid about 950,000, which was less than we were supposed to. So that's good. And well, as Robin said, we're moving forward with uh, the community discussion about the kind of items they want in the park. In the master plan, we had a central lawn space for sports and activities. There was a, there was a community garden. There, was, there were playground and, and a small splash pad, a pathway around it, picnic shelters, a loo, landscaping, and a small parking area. So we don't know if we can afford all those things, but we're asking people, what are your top choices? Thanks, Erin. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think the acquiring that right now the park is very hard to access. Um, and so acquiring that area was an exciting development. And I think it'll make that park a lot more accessible and available. Thank you. Any other additions or questions for Aaron? 
If not, um, let's move into the financial sustainability work group update. Mike. Great, thanks, Bonnie. Um, so just to put a bow on the fiscal year that ended on June 30th, um, it was a pretty crazy year that included a number of rebuilds of the budget um, and also the creation of a supplemental budget um, around the levy, which was passed last fall. Um, one purpose of that supplemental budget was to give parks the ability to access a bridge loan to start to build out capacity for the levy um, initiatives and to deliver on, on programming for the summer. And at the end of the day, the good news is the Bureau actually didn't need to access that loan. They finished the year under budget and underspent on their general fund allocation by about a, a million and a half um, dollars. So that's great news. Um, the re revenue budgets, the adjusted revenue budgets for the year were, um, uh, were, were very conservative for the year and the Bureau was able to beat those. But just to give you a sense for um, how unusual the year was, um, revenue from service charges and programming fees in the, the two fiscal years prior to the pandemic uh, were around $20 million each year. Um, and then in the last fiscal year, they were just a little over 5 million, about 5.7 million. So uh, just a little more than a quarter of what those revenues normally are. So it was definitely an unusual year. And then um, one thing also that was mentioned as it relates to the last fiscal year in Adina's monthly report, um, system development charges for the last fiscal year were just over $16 million, which was a, a seven year low um, for the Bureau but it was higher than what was budgeted for. So they did come in on the good side of the budget uh, for that as well. Um, in our working group meeting on Thursday, uh, Claudio gave us an overview of the five-year forecasting and planning process as it relates to the levy allocations that are gonna be made over the next five years. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this forecasting, no surprise, and there's lots of moving pieces. So it's likely that the Bureau is gonna be needing to make adjustments over time. So we'll be keeping an eye on those as those adjustments are made. Um, as part of that process, the Bureau's trying to build in some cushion against uh, general fund reductions, which are likely to occur um, in, the near, in the near future. In this five-year planning and uh, plot process and the parts operating levy priorities are gonna inform the uh, upcoming, upcoming fall bump. Um, Adina talked a little bit about how the various inputs um, and the decision support tool uh, fit into the budget submission process. Um, the budget needs to be submitted by to the city budget office on September 9th uh, and shooting for approval in late October or early November. It's likely that the fall bump requests are going to include about $13 million in ongoing allocations of levy funds. So that's the first um, significant commitment of levy funds um, in this process. And then the first two budget advisory committee meetings uh, related to the fall bump are now on the calendar. Um, breaking news, I think I just saw in my email that the one that was scheduled for this Thursday has now been rescheduled. So for those of you that are on the BAC, if you haven't seen that yet, um, take a look at your email. Um, for those of you that are new to the board, um, the, the BAC is composed of a few members of this board, um, as well as some representatives from various community groups and uh, labor organizations. And it's tasked with uh, providing feedback on budget decisions and their alignment with the committee's values. And, Normally the BAC would not be involved um, with the fall bump. Um, usually it's just involved with annual budget setting, uh, but this is kind of an unusual year and with the supplemental budget involving um, some significant levy allocation. So they decided to include the BAC in that process as well, which I think is a, a great idea. Um, and then finally, I, I wanted to just point out that our, our working group is in the early stages, very early stages of exploring some federal grant opportunities through the EDA American Rescue Plan. Um, at a very high level glance, it looks like there might be some potential capital and programming grant opportunities. Um, but we're really in a, a discovery phase right now, trying to learn you know, what the opportunities are, if there are some. Um, also, what are parks capabilities and their capacity to pursue this? And then as a board, if, if there's any way we might be able to support um, any efforts in this area. Um, so hopefully more to come on that. Um, that's what I have. Are there any questions or additional comments anybody else on the working group want to make? Thank you, Mike. Um, anyone have any questions for Mike or anyone have anything to add? I don't see Claudio. He's usually the one. Paul, do you have anything you want to add? I know you often sometimes do. No? If not, thank you, Mike, for the very thorough report. Um, Patty, can we hear what's going on with um, the land use and infrastructure working group? 
Yes, indeed. Uh, we met, um, as usual, a week before this meeting. Um, the main topic of conversation was a report by Tamara on graffiti abatement process and plan, uh, which is quite an elaborate thing. I think the whole board will be hearing about that possibly next month. Um, so I won't go into great detail on it, but it's, it's a very carefully thought out plan to um, not only deal with, with graffiti that appear, but address how, how, do we, uh, how do we prevent them happening in the first place, which seems important. Um, <clears throat> we spent a little bit of time talking about um, the Burnside Bridge update. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the meetings have again been postponed. The focus is on cutting budgets, and um, we have some concern about um, uh, less attention being paid to some of the aesthetic uh, uh, aspects of the project. So Randy and I um, represent, are represented on, the, on that group. Um, <clears throat> the, um, what, oh, the South Park Blocks Master Plan, as you all know, was accepted by City Council. Um, I think the takeaway from that is that um, people take more notice of what they read on social media than what the master plan in this case actually said. Um, there was so much misinformation. It was picked up by very well-respected citizens who, who ought to know better, who went so far as to publish their views in the paper, but it was completely erroneous. So it's, it's something I'm afraid we're gonna have to um, look out for in a lot of projects. Um, there was brief discussion of a Bryant Square. There's a scheme for basically um, um, decorating the, 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 the surrounding fence. And uh, we began to probe, but you know, is there something which might be more long-term uh, uh, um, uh, and, and, and um, more impactful that we might think about? Uh, we haven't got any further on that yet. So that really covers what we, what we went over. There are a number of other topics which I think will be addressed uh, in September. Anything to add for the other members person? Okay, that's, that's our report. Thank you, Patty. Anything any of the other members of the working group wanna add or any questions to the group? Just wondering with the um, sort of uh, park blocks and that whole, you know, obviously social media is definitely more powerful than the source material, sadly. Um, I guess, are there any lessons learned on how to be proactive about these spaces in the future? And, um, you know, uh, not that, not implying people weren't proactive, but are there any ways to mitigate for the kinds of sort of misinformation that happened or, uh, sort of help along the process in the future so something like that doesn't happen again in the same way? That's a really good question. And, and um, I think that uh, park staff were pretty diligent in responding right away as these questions came up. I mean, they've been going on for months. I know Tate White has spent an awful lot of time responding to questions from uh, members of the public. Um, Randy has a, a thought about this. Yeah, I was, you know, kind of, I, I was on the CAC and then also um, personally know a lot of the folks who were um, um, spreading misinformation. I think some um, intentionally and some, uh, you know, herd mentality. Uh, and I think it would be really useful um, for uh, senior PPR folks and a few others involved to have a, 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 a real debrief on it. Cause I mean, it was pretty messy and ugly. Um, and I think that it would be good to just, you know, go back and kind of think about, you know, what might've been done earlier to, um, you know, to head, head some of it off at the pass. I think, you know, we're living in an age in which, um, you know, this is extremely hard to do. And, and it was, you know, pretty weird to see, um, you know, sort of 
tactics really, you know, used by, um, you know, things that we saw, like, for instance, in the presidential election applied to this, you know, little master plan, uh, you know, creating this enormous tempest in a teapot, um, but leaving a lot of ill will, um, you know, behind. And, and I, I just think it would be really great to, um, you know, devote an hour to, um, you know, to talking about it and thinking about, you know, other issues on the horizon in which, uh, um, you know, could be more, uh, you know, proactive in, in, uh, uh, in, in engagement. You know, I, I, I don't think anybody did anything wrong on the PPR side, but I think there are some lessons to be learned for sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to second that. There certainly could be lessons learned from this. And yeah, no one at PPNR did anything wrong. It's just, how do we go to work in a way that combats this misinformation. And there was a lot of misinformation and um, that, that trend is not going to change. So we just need to get more savvy about how we deal with it. I don't know if any staff want to respond. I think there are always lessons learned. Um, so I think a debrief would, would be valuable. I don't know that we as the board can do much. Um, I see Tim sort of looking at us intently. Maybe he's multitasking. I'm not really sure. Okay, he's multitasking then. Never mind. Um, but maybe he's he's taking this all in anyway. So I mean, I well, think Tim. Tim would say this, but for those of you that work in, uh, you know, either managing a business or managing a nonprofit organization, how you combat misinformation is by having people that are well respected by the people that are spreading the misinformation hear the message from them. And so that's where I think all of us on the call actually do have a responsibility to do that whether it's what happened in Waterfront Park over the weekend about vac vaccinations and uh, white supremacy in the community, or whether it's you know people spreading misinformation about a master plan because they don't want their community to change. You know, it's people's social networks that they're in. Th those are the places where we have to get super sophisticated and tap into them, and that's where we need a large coalition of people to combat misinformation. Uh, Lauren has her hand up, as does Adrian. So I was gonna basically um, reiterate what Todd said, but I think it would be helpful for the, the parks board to, to be involved in helping to mitigate some of that as well. We had, I can't tell you how many meetings with the people that were spreading the misinformation and trying to, to explain it to them, both about the green loop and about the trees and back and forth and back and forth and, um, and the downtown neighborhood coalition. So I, I think it would be helpful, like Todd said, to have to engage someone or some people within the parks board to, to help with that messaging too. And, um, and regarding the um, the hot wash, I'm happy to do that. I think it's not a bad idea. I'd like to know who you think you would like to participate in that. Um, can I make a suggestion? It, would it be worthwhile to have the land use and, in, and infrastructure working group um, host a one of our upcoming meetings to focus on debrief on the South Park blocks? It would. Uh, I think we have a quorum problem, however. Uh, we're already at capacity on our on our meeting, um, that may, may have to be a public meeting. That's true. Um, 
because yeah, we we have the same problem that Aaron mentioned. The land use and infrastructure working group has the same problem as the community engagement working group. Um, so that'll be something that we'll need to figure out. And if that means that it becomes a public meeting, um, we might need to go through the um, public notice process for doing that. So, but I don't think that's somebody who's more familiar with the process, I mean, that's not an issue, right? We just need to provide the notice and then we can go ahead and do that. Okay. I'd say it's not an issue, but it does mean that the public would be right invited to attend. Um, Understood. Which, I'm not um, really sure. I'm not really sure if I want to put my staff uh, through that, given how public this has already been. Just so putting that out there. Okay. Um, well, it is possible we won't have a quorum, in which case it won't be a public meeting. It'll be just a regular land use working infrastructure group, working group meeting. Okay, I have more hands up. I have Adrian, Tim, um, and then Lauren was at a legacy hand. Adrian. Yeah, so just really quickly. So, I mean, I, I was new to both this board and Urban Forestry Commission as this unfolded and came in the middle you know, reading the reports on South Park blocks and so forth. And I, I've just found it really remarkable how Portland Parks and Rec and the, the whole planning process was so much more extensive than I've really almost ever seen before <laughs> in any work that I've done. So I would commend them. So I don't know how preventable this really is, this type of thing. But um, you know, one thing is recognizing what are the what are the emotional hot buttons to this work, whatever that work is. And so, in this case, one really big one was the cutting down of old trees. And when I read the report, you know, sometimes we try to be PC in our language, and I couldn't figure out really whether any trees were going to be cut down before their time, so to speak. So, you know, maybe that's just one thing that we could do. I and mean, finally, that was really clarified and certainly in, in separate letter communications to complainants uh, that was clarified. So uh, anyway, that was one point. And the second, the second thing I wanted to say was just that uh, would really support giving uh, folks, especially leaders in the community that will be involved in the future, even just an, a listening session with them as a debrief, I think is very therapeutic and can be helpful to diffuse things in the future. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Tim. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Thank you, Adrian. That was um, good context. Appreciate your experience through that. Um, you know, I think um, Bonnie and others are right. There is always something to learn through these processes, you know, um, an overabundance of um, messaging and sharing accurate information is always helpful. I do want to share, though, from 15 years in affordable housing development and the siting of shelters for people transitioning from homelessness. Um, it's not, there are times when it's not about accurate information. It's times where people are looking to find wedge issues. Um, to make sure that their, their neighborhoods don't change. Um, and so you can share all the accurate information you want in the world, um, but if someone doesn't want things to change and if people don't want um, new folks coming into their community, they will often use the traditional level, levers of power um, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Any more questions or comments on what's going on for, with the Land Use and Infrastructure Working Group? Okay. If not, um, Casey is going to talk a little bit about a potential new working group. Um, as we've mentioned a couple times now, we've got two working groups that are bumping up or over a quorum when all members participate. Um, and um, as we all know, the intent of the working groups is not to have a quorum of uh, board members, but instead be where we can actually roll up our sleeves and get some of the work done um, and ideally be under quorum. Um, and it's occurred to us that sort of board affairs uh, is something that could be 
potentially spun off and really productive in its own working group. And I'll let Casey talk about the kinds of things that we're thinking about putting into that working group. Well, thank you, Bonnie. This will be really short. Um, in the past, when issues have come up regarding board policy, uh, board governance, uh, they've been handled by individuals, ad hoc committees, or pushed into working groups that it really didn't fit. Um, so as um, Bonnie indicated, uh, we're going to try uh, a new working group that will either be called the board affairs group or the board policy group. Uh, it's going to, uh, it hopefully will capture all issues pertaining to board policy and governance. Um, the first one that they were going to look at was the board composition matrix, both in terms of what is on the list for the matrix and what the definitions are of those. The issue that will probably fall right behind it uh, is going to be the initial draft of the revised mission statement for the board. Um, but there are other possible issues that could come up, as you say, they, they, they pop up all the time. Um, and as Bonnie said, we're going to um, try this, see how it works. Uh, I hope that people are interested. It's definitely going to be the best working group there is. Uh, probably only take a little bit of time every month, uh, a little bit of homework every month, um, but it shouldn't be too egregious. Um, if you're interested at all, please contact me. Uh, my email is in the Zoom list. Uh, I'll also put it in the chat, uh, and hopefully we can schedule something up before uh, the next meeting. Definitely one of the top four working groups of this board. Um, Casey, and, I feel like you're moonlighting on the decision support tool working group. We can fold it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, for folks who were participating in the nominating committee, again, I, I would love to see the folks who were participating in that get involved in this working group. Um, as Casey mentioned, the board matrix, composition matrix is gonna be one of the first things we look at. Also, you know, who's on what working board is gonna be the, the sort of um, arena of this working group so that I don't have to mess it up, who is on what board uh, or on what working group. Um, and a lot of these issues have come up that we just end up, you know, Paul and I had addressed either on the fly or with the leadership team. Um, but I think it will be great to have a, a governance working group. We'll see how it goes. Um, so the only thing that has yet to be determined is um, staff support on that. But I think right now, um, since you know Casey is going to be the the ad hoc chair of it, you know, and he's he's got a direct line with me to Brooke and Adina. Um, we're going to just sort of see how it goes um, if we don't have an immediate um, staff member assigned to that working group. And I that doesn't bother me right now, Casey. I don't know. And, how and Bonnie, just, just so you know, I did ask Brooke and she was smart enough to refer it up to Adina. Because um, I really don't see there's going to be much staff need for staff support, but I definitely will need help with um, getting meetings going. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so anybody who's interested in that, um, please let Casey know. Um, I think it would be good to have broad involvement from new and old uh, board members, some who can provide some, you know, uh, institutional context and then new members who um, can bring up the perspective, fresh perspective we need. Nope. Any questions? I have to check for hands again. I'm, I do a bad job. Okay, Adrian. I think she has her hand sorry, up. Sorry, sorry, that was perennially up. No, no question, I'm good. <laughs> oh, all right, legacy hand raise. All right, um, so let's move on then to uh, the process improvement ad hoc. Um, so that's me and I see Tanya joined so she can correct me if I mess anything up. Tanya did provide me a briefing of what's going on there. Um, and by way of background, I think I've mentioned it a couple times now, so hopefully everybody knows. This was when um, the late Commissioner Nick Fish um, had the Bureau of Environmental Services and the Parks Bureau, and he was interested in finding efficiencies um, across the bureaus um, in areas of shared responsibility. Um, at this point, um, the natural areas is the area that's going to be the next focus for this, um, this kind of 
joint working group. Um, and it's not a working group because it's, it's mostly staff. Um, so at this time, there is a MOA um, on, I believe it's either nine or 11 sites, Tanya, um, that are co-managed with BES and parks. Um, and most of them are low and medium um, uh, sensitivity. Um, the only one that's high sensitivity, I, my understanding is the foster floodplain. Um, so that's gonna take a little bit more um, in-depth analysis in terms of how that gets worked out in terms of the memor memorandum of understanding between the two bureaus. Um, but at this point, um, that's what's going on. It's a highly collaborative process across the staff involved with the two bureaus um, to ensure that both the um, intent of what the bureaus, two bureaus are needing to do is, is captured um, as well as um, the, the overall goals um, uh, and protecting of the, of the natural areas themselves. Tanya, anything you want to add on that? Uh, that's a fantastic summary. It is uh, 11 sites, although we're looking at this collaborative process as something that we hopefully will replicate as we look at natural areas and city property um, and, and the goals of that property. A, a lot of the complexity has to do with how properties were acquired and sometimes um, you know, how the investments were made. And also uh, because the, the properties themselves are not monolithic there are there are many different aspects um, we have looked at you know on an asset based approach maybe there's a way to do that uh, and continue to have those conversations um, another uh, so the, the the low complexity sites are essentially ones that um, uh, may or may not be changing hands in terms of who's managing it from the bureau perspective um, but really we can just give clear direction to our, our crews on the ground to do the management, ecological management of those sites. Um, and the higher complexity ones are ones where um, there's, there's strong connection to both bureaus, Bureau of Environmental Services and also Parks and Recreation. And also, um, again, you know, like foster floodplain, um, it's really important for, for flood management, flood control, and it's also an important access, access point for parks with the bridge and the parking lot and the work we do there. And so that adds to the complexity and also uh, impact of camping as well. So another one that is, is teetering towards more complicated is Big Four Corners um, because of the heavy impact of, of longstanding camping activity in that site and uh, some of the environmental degradation. Um, so working with, with many partners on, on that particular site. But um, yes, it is something that was born out of the process improvement and, and just prior to that, so this is work collaborative work with BES that started in 2018. Uh, the MOA was, was an early piece of that work with the nine specific sites. There was some, uh, uh, an agreement in place that, that MOA has expired as of the fiscal year this summer and uh, the work that we've done the last 11 or 12 months meeting with BES or natural area partners um, is just really to untangle and, and be specific about who has management responsibility. And uh, to, again, to really guide employees on the ground. And then also to give good, clear points of contact in terms of, um, you know, for internal and external customers. So, thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Any questions on that? If not, Paul, can you give us a brief update on what's going on with the Levy Oversight Committee? Sure. Uh, the Levy Oversight Committee met last month on July 12th, and we'll meet quarterly going forward. So we've got a doodle poll out for the next meeting, which will be either the end of September, early October. There's five community members and five staff, and the overall goals are recreation for all, uh, protect and grow nature, and community partnerships. And the role of the, as the acronym goes, PLOC, is um, reviewing information and verifying general compliance with the levy, reviewing the financial audit, and producing an annual report for city council. And going forward, we're going to establish um, a charter and, um, and bylaws, and then um, just review how we operate as a public body. And let's see. We are gonna decide about whether we're gonna operate uh, by consensus or whether we'll have a chair. And the chair's role would be assisting with setting agenda and, and other sort of housekeeping items like that. And then work out our agreements in terms of ground rules. 
Uh, we had a community engagement debrief. We had a debrief on the fall bump and the budget. And we did some brainstorming on priorities. And I think in terms of um, interests that were expressed among the oversight committee members were building climate resiliency for underserved communities, developing community partnerships, uh, sharing more information about ecologically sustainable land management practices, tracking workforce development, uh, taking a deeper dive on community engagement, and moving towards a pay what you can mode for recreation programs. So that's the brief overview of the clock. I'll take any questions that people may have. Thank you, Paul. Any questions? If not, um, Randy, can you fill us in on what's going on with the foundation? Yeah, sure. Um... So I'm going to share screen real quick here. Let's give you a little update. Whoops. There we go. Here's our snazzy graphics for Paseo, which is in two and a half weeks uh, on the South Park blocks. Um, things are in that crazy state that you really wonder what's going to happen. But uh, we've got an amazing roster of artists, an amazing roster of, uh, sorry, I need the garbage day in my neighborhood, lots of trucks. Um, we've got an amazing array of artists and an amazing array of mutual aid groups that we're um, honoring. And uh, PGE is our lead sponsor and uh, City of Portland and Standard uh, Insurance, Melvin Mark and the Miller Foundation have all come in as uh, sponsors as well. And we had um, over, th um, four, over 40 sponsors total. This is a totally new festival, um, kind of an experiment. Um, and uh, we're um, you know, thrilled that so many people were willing to uh, take a chance on this. Uh, so hope to see you there. We're rolling out lots of social media. Um, uh, obviously, in the coming days, uh, we finalized our artist roster um, just a couple of days ago. So uh, this is happening. It's moving. Um, it's exciting. And we hope uh, weather um, will cooperate um, and uh, other things will cooperate. Uh, so that's uh, Paseo in a nutshell. Um, and then uh, I just thought I'd kind of share this fun little bit. Um, our poster sales have gone swimmingly. Um, we are in a second run of Peninsula Park, Laurelhurst and Wildwood. Uh, Al Alberta Park, uh, I think it sold a few more than this, um, uh, but it's been kind of bringing up, it's been a little slower. Um, I think that the color palette uh, is uh, a little challenging for some Portlanders to associate with their parks. Um, uh, but we are preparing to um, go out for another round um, and commission um, perhaps as many as four more po posters. Uh, we've had interest from a num number of parks groups. We want to honor um, uh, one or two of our new parks. Um, and so we're sort of going through a process of deciding uh, which parks uh, we'll do and how to match those with, uh, with designers. Um, the way this has worked, I'll uh, take the screen share down, and just talk to y'all. Um, you know, the, the original sort of notion was something that was, uh, you know, kind of uh, in the flavor of uh, WPA uh, uh, National Parks posters. And we did a competition with um, Design Week Portland, uh, an RFQ process, uh, and we had a, a, a jury of uh, design professionals plus our city's creative laureate. Um, uh, who did the selection process. And we came up with these uh, four designers in a kind of blind process. So we're sort of uh, rethinking about that because uh, we ended up with uh, all white designers and the, and the committee, which was majority BIPOC, um, uh, determined that they wanted to stick with their choices. Um, and so we moved ahead. So we're going to do a, a, a different outreach process, and a different jurying process and um, um, be more, um, I don't know, I guess that, that was sort of a passive way of doing it. And, and we erred in a couple of ways and learned some lessons. 
Um, so we're going to reboot the process uh, going forward and come up with four new posters. But the way it worked financially um, was that we paid each of the designers a thousand dollars for their design. Um, and so one thing that we're sort of uh, uh, looking for are sponsors of posters, um, and particularly for uh, posters that are not in you know the wealthier neighborhoods that it's easy to get sponsorship uh, for. So if it, um, I would ask the board uh, for several things on this front. If you, one, know of somebody who would be interested in, in sponsoring one of these posters, that would be awesome. Um, two, if you know designers, um, particularly by POC, POC designers who you think would be a good fit. Um, uh, Corbin, I've uh, been working with, um, um, why have I suddenly blanked on her name? Um, she's a professor at PSU who has an amazing array of designers and we'll be uh, uh, working with her. Uh, to identify some emerging uh, designers for the next round. Um, so, um, and then meantime, if you haven't bought one, consider uh, picking up one. There's two versions of these first four, thanks to a, a contribution from um, John Miller of Mahonia uh, Companies. Uh, and he uh, commissioned um, Malowney Printing Company, which is a world-renowned um, printing press to do silkscreen versions of these posters. Um, and they're absolutely sumptuous, beautiful posters. We're going to be giving them as a perk to our higher end donors. And we'll be also putting those out for sale probably uh, closer to sort of year, year end. Um, so it was kind of a really interesting project, um, you know, sort of walking and, and um, as they say, you know, walking is nothing but falling forward and catching yourself. We learned a lot from it um, and looking forward to the, to the next round. Um, lastly, we continue our conversations with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with PPR on kind of what our future is post levy in terms of our relationship. We've identified a, uh, a facilitator and strategic planner to uh, help us uh, both uh, source best practices around the country and have a, a good solid conversation between the two institutions on how best to uh, move forward. Um, and I think that's what I have right now. Hopefully I'll have some other news on some other projects uh, perhaps um, but when we meet next month. Any questions? Thank you, Randy. Any um, questions for Randy? We are gonna talk a little bit later. Brooke's gonna talk about potential um, opportunities for people have been antsy to meet in person for potential social opportunities and we're targeting the Paseo as one of the events where board members can get together and, and meet up socially if they're so inclined so stay tuned for that oh yeah one thing I'm, I'm just actually getting the invite out um there is a a, a gathering of um uh our steering committee and our sponsors and uh, some of my board members and and um hopefully some artists um if we can uh, uh, wrangle them uh, to um, next uh, a week from Wednesday or no excuse me Wednesday the 25th at um, 4 30 to uh, 6 p.m on uh, Shemansky Square so if you're free put that in your calendar I'll send an invite to the board thanks I got a quick question Bonnie um, Greg for Randy rather um, for artists that may want to participate how soon do you need to know that um, I don't think we'll be moving on, on the next round of posters until after Paseo. Um, we're still kind of thinking through the process, but so I would say uh, probably a call will go out in early, uh, probably mid-September being realistic. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Casey, for clarifying. Anything else for Randy? Thank you. Um, with that, um, Todd, can we go ahead and get the briefing on the staff, um, staff safety training and extreme heat protocols? And I'm sorry, Victor is not well, so he can't join us. Yes, I will not be doing staff training, but I'm going to do heat protocols uh, because Victor will need to present that when he's back. Um, Victor so, or Vicente, right? Right. Vicente's out this week and Victor is ill uh, right now. So hopefully everyone's drinking plenty of water, taking your vitamins, wearing your mask, getting your vaccines, take care of yourself. 
get some sleep, everybody. Stay healthy. The world's coming at us this week again. Um, so uh, severe heat emergency for the region. And so I'll go over that, what the city and county are doing and what Parks is doing and what we're doing for our workers. National Weather Service has issued an excessive heat warning for the region. It's, an, it's gonna be in effect uh, noon Wednesday through 10 p.m. Saturday. So this means dangerously hot conditions with temperatures up to 105 expected. Our hottest days are expected to be Thursday and Friday, being slightly cooler. Saturday looks to be the beginning of the cool down with daytime highs being below 100. Overnight temperatures will likely remain in the mid 60s to low 70s. Uh, one of the things for kind of human health, anytime nighttime temperatures aren't getting below 70, there's a lot of concern in the community. Uh, that's important for people to have like cool down time in the evenings for their bodies to recover for the next hot day. So when we don't do that, that's oftentimes when you're gonna see the city and county uh, go into an emergency response. So in this case, the city and county are gonna be, in, or are start, starting now in unified command uh, to activate a combined emergency operations center today through Saturday the 14th. This will be for the operations of cooling centers, also providing kind of a supply hub for uh, materials for volunteer groups that are distributing, uh, whether it's misting stations or water. Um, the cooling setting centers and misting stations are gonna be a combination of county facilities and city facilities. Um, Tim's, I think, already put in a volunteer sign up. So for those of you that would like to volunteer at one of these locations, you are welcome. Also, if you could share it with your networks, we're especially uh, have had some mixed success in the last event about getting enough volunteers for the misting stations at six of our parks this time. And so all you need to do is show up and hang out and have mist flow over you and watch people enjoy the cool misting station. So it's an easy lift. Um, the uh, city and county are using something called, uh, that NOAA uses and National Weather use, Service uses, it's a heat risk index. I'm gonna put it in the uh, chat just so you can learn more about it. It's a combination of kind of multiple days of hot weather, looking at how much it cools down in the evenings and then maximum tem temperature as well as humidity. So a lot of factors go into it. So it's not as quite as clear as saying, um, you know, you shut down at a certain temperature, you know, 100 degrees, for instance, historically has been our practice at Portland Parks and Recreation when we uh, have either brought camps inside close them for outside uh, reasons, mitigated uh, our, our work historically, kind of that 100 degree threshold. The new of all thinking is it's more complex than that. Um, and so take a look at that heat index and you'll see um, for Multnomah County in the region, um, a yellow is kind of a hot day, sensitive uh, populations, you know, start having um, issues for Wednesday. The forecast is to be mostly red and orange, uh, which means that more of the population is going to express uh, health problems related to the heat. Thursday is almost entirely red for the whole region. And then Friday is forecast to be magenta. And that's the highest level. So that's all populations will if you're outside, not in air condition, you're going to have health effects likely due to the heat. And then Saturday, it's supposed to start again, waning down, cooling off, uh, and Sunday, getting back to kind of where we started, uh, you know, later today and tomorrow. So, um, Oregon Occupational Safety and Health Division has adopted new temporary rules. Um, maybe you saw some of this in the media. Um, and so for that, uh, they're measuring on just 
uh, the heat index and the degrees outside. So those measures start going in at 80 degrees and then at 90 degrees. So the rules are in effect for the next 180 days and they're temporary. And these are things about making sure that our staff take uh, breaks in the shade if they're working outside and then also take providing clean, cool drinking water to all workers at all times. So we send out daily alerts to all of our staff when we start going into hot weather about educating them what they can do for themselves, looking out for each other, making sure they're taking 10 minute breaks every two hours of working outside. We have a variety of protocols for different specific work groups. For instance, our lifeguards, we've got misting stations, shade, shade being provided, providing electrolytes uh, to them, asking them to jump into the pool um, prior to during their rotations. So lots of different ways and techniques that we try to keep our staff safe and continue uh, services that the public likes. However, there is a maximum at some point. And so the last heat event, uh, we closed outdoor pools and actually our indoor pools because our indoor pools aren't air conditioned. Uh, and so they can get very hot as well. And so while that might be counterintuitive to some, as you can imagine, when you stand on a hot sidewalk, I think Vivek Shandas, our urban forestry chair, uh, if you've read the Lamb Week art article, measured the temperature in the Lentz neighborhood and it was 180 degrees on the pavement in the Lentz neighborhood. So we have pavement around pools, it's hot. There's a, there's a limit at some point where it's not safe for the public or our workers to even be at a swimming pool. And so uh, we'll be monitoring that this week about closures, making sure both the messages get out to the public and uh, we make sure we don't have staff stay outside longer than is safe. Um, that is about it. So we can expect schedule changes for workers this week. Um, they, if they are, um, we have administrative rules in the city about this, and this will be a citywide thing, not just a parks led thing. Um, and for the cooling centers, we'll be at Charles Jordan Community Center for a daytime shelter that'll be open between noon and nine and the parks that will have misting stations. And we tried to pick locations where they have public restrooms available and also uh, don't have uh, existing spray, spray feature. So Lens Park, Knott Park, Mount Scott Park, East Portland Community Center, Harney Park and Glenhaven Park are the six locations. And uh, if you didn't think climate change existed, we also have a uh, harmful algae bloom in the Willamette River uh, that's been tested by DEQ that it's safe for recreation, but not safe for humans or animals to drink. So be careful, don't bring your dog down to uh, Selwood Riverfront Park and have them drink a bunch of water. I'm gonna pause there. Could go into wildfire, but there's probably a lot there. All right. Thank you, Todd. Um, any questions on the um, uh, extreme heat, uh, the cooling centers and the misting centers that Todd just went over? Bonnie went on mute. Sorry, I did that by accident. I was aiming for my box and then the box moved. Adrian has her hand up. Thanks. Uh, yeah, great report. Um, so what is the threshold then for closure? Is there, it's a temperature threshold or are you going according to the colors or how? how yeah, you so that uh, the colors, are, this heat index is new, um, more sophisticated, but not defined bands. So it makes it really hard to be very clear about, you know, that's what's nice about the temperature. Our historic practice has been hundred degrees. Okay, great, 100 degrees. We're gonna bring kids inside. We're gonna cancel classes that don't have shade or air conditioning or proper facilities. We'll slow down work or 
close work early. Um, so we're in discussions. We got a incident command meeting at 11 today and there'll be a decision made here shortly. But generally, if you look at the red, which is um, not, it, it's when most of the population is going to start having heat effects, that's when you're going to see things closing down at parks. Um, and I'll just give an example. So we have um, some sun school camps at school locations where we don't have access to the inside buildings. And so that's one of our earlier activities to close because we don't have shade on site and we don't have access to the buildings where a camp at a Portland Parks and Recreation Facility that has access to the inside building, we might just move the camp inside and it wouldn't have to be closed. Um, yeah. So Thanks. that's kind yeah. of where we are. I, yeah. I, I wish I just had a number, would make it a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get exactly. Chair Kavori and Mayor Wheeler to all agree. If I just had one number, it'd be a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, and just a quick second question. So, you know, some of the data coming out are interesting. Um, so, you know, we thought that these deaths would be neighborhood related where there's some of that, but um, it's actually, you know, really much higher death rate in the elderly. Um, so throughout the city, uh, and then also these, the trailer parks, and I'm just wondering, you know, if Portland Parks and Rec thought at all about their ability to, um, uh, assist with those areas or communicate or that sort of thing. Yeah. So the county's in the lead really about outreach with the joint office, um, and so they'll be pushing out alert messages to people's cell phones, which they didn't do in that event, uh, but they'll be doing this and during this event. You know, our best role is with the kind of networks that we have with our partners to try to partner with them and then also our physical facilities. Um, but you're right, um, I think the findings with, from that research, and I'm not a public health expert, but um, you know, people need to be knocking on doors and trusted um, organizations and people need to be doing outreach to people that are living at home without air conditioning and, with, and you know, on buildings, like you said, um, that are high rise, or high rise buildings that don't have air conditioning or trailer parts uh, that aren't insulated. Our organizational capacity to do that is to do the door knocking is limited. Thank you. Um, Corbin has her hand up and Allie does. Thank you. I just, I have some clarifying questions if possible. So sure. the actual facilities that do have air conditioning at this time will remain open during so the, our, the, hot, the hottest times, I just want to, they may not be functioning as cooling stations, but will they be available to the public? So our community centers aren't open right now. Oh, so okay. they're, not, no. they're not staffed to be open in a normal year. They would be, you're right. Okay. All of our buildings would normally be open and kind of the scale up for us in a normal year is not such a big deal because we would have our buildings fully staffed. They would be open we'd set aside rooms people could drop by in cold or winter weather. Of course, we're in a COVID year, this problem is, so we've scaled up for outside operations only, and we still haven't hired all the people that we need. And so we're, we're just coordinating our indoor response with the county. And so we actually offered up, for instance, St. John's Community Center and talked about other options, but they focus just on Charles Jordan uh, for daytime shelter. There's going to be an, a shelter in Arbor Lodge uh, that the county is going to be operating. And so it's really kind of a joint city county response. The Portland building, for instance, is also going to be open uh, downtown. Okay. And so those, and some of those facilities were actually activated the last time, the, the last heat wave that we had, um, I believe. Um, right. The Portland building and Charles Jordan were. Do you have any information regarding on any sort of energy issues with any of these buildings? Because I know that they did shut down um, 
uh, public transportation at one point when it got too hot. And so for those folks who need to get to these facilities, um, what is the, the protocol of getting folks there if um, we, we deal with another public transportation shutdown? Yeah, so 211 is an option and a resource. Um, there's a partnership between uh, Lyft and Uber and the county and uh, joint office about people being able to get rides. And so for instance, while we have a daytime shelter um, at Charles Jordan, at the end of the day, we can get uh, rides for them to go to an overnight shelter if they want like to go overnight shelter. And the county outreach workers will make this call, but in exceptional cases where maybe there's children involved and others where an overnight shelter might not be appropriate, they'll be offering uh, motel rooms. Thank you. And my, my last question is because of COVID and the shutting down of these particular facilities, which could be, would have been really beneficial during, during the summer, is there any protocol moving forward to make sure this situation doesn't happen again during the summer? when we possibly need those facilities for cooling centers? Yeah, for sure. So we're hoping to pivot after we conclude summer programming to staff up to have our community centers appropriately staffed so then under public health guidance that they can be operated. So my expectation is by next summer, we'll be operating in our new normal under public health guidelines, but we'll have proper staffing to be able to operate our buildings. Um, to your point about mechanical failures, we had three community centers. Uh, their HVAC systems go down. We have a heat compressor, for instance, at Mount Scott, that's still out. And so we do have some old buildings. It's a great project at Mount Scott that's going to renovate that building. But we've, on multiple different funding rounds, suggested that our large community centers, our five regional centers should be kind of resilient centers and we should be upgrading the HVAC so then we can also operate them during a smoke emergency, which we currently, they don't have a proper filtration system and turnover of airflow right now. So for a mere $15 million, we could do that at all five centers and then we could really have them be resiliency centers. Um, so we've tried, maybe some more advocacy with council and Sadly, more hot weather. We'll see the uh, good thinking and investing in that. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be great if they're also energy independent. I'll just throw that out there as well. Yeah, that, yeah. That's We actually got some funding to get um, East Portland Community Centers got solar and we're getting uh, battery backup uh, there. So East Portland's on its way, but you're right. Either solar, um, even movable generators. Um, I've lived overseas before and you can put any building on a generator, it's just big. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Ellie? Yeah. Um, so just thinking of the last heat event and how uh, good stats weren't put out, but it was noted that um, many of the people who died had underlying health conditions, uh, which I read as disabilities, who may be neurodivergent, who have chronic illness. Um, so just in thinking about your messaging, um, you know, even if it's, if folks think it's a given that community centers are ADA, right, really noting that they're accessible places, really pushing that transportation is, uh, is free, like pushing all of those resources and thinking of who died, who was, you know, uh, who really struggled the most. It was a lot of elderly folks and it was a lot of people with disabilities. So using language that really speaks specifically to those communities as signals to say that they don't have to get in touch to make sure their wheelchair can get in or they don't have to reach out to make sure that their scooter or life-saving device can be plugged in when they're there or whatever it happens to be. So just thinking of who who was impacted last time and how you can over communicate this time. So more just a suggestion than a question. And you might already be doing it, but yeah. That's uh, great. Tim's nodding his head. He's on, there's a county city joint information team that's doing this. So that's great feedback. And one of the barriers is people's pets. And so these daytime cooling centers and overnight centers that are gonna be open 
not the libraries, but uh, at least the ones we're operating, people can bring their pets. We had a chicken show up last time. That's also really great. During Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people died because they didn't leave. They didn't want to leave their animals. I mean, there's so much to learn from all of these natural disasters that span so much time on who's vulnerable and what are the big barriers for folks. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Tim's. Loving your suggestions in the chat. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Corbin. Um, thanks, Todd, for the update. Um, so looking ahead, as I mentioned, a lot of us are anxious to those of us, who, especially those of us who are fully vaccinated, you know, interested in opportunities to get together in real life. Um, looking ahead for next month, we do have a couple of items that are going to get pushed to next month's agenda. The fire risk um, topic will get pushed there, um, as well as the staff training, which um, Victor and Vicente weren't able to address this time. Um, but think about if there's other um, agenda items that you want to see. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Brooke to talk a little bit about potential ideas for getting together at parks events, outdoor um, safe parks events, including Paseo. Sure, yeah, I just uh, feel like we've been working uh, remotely for so long and haven't had an opportunity to come together. Um, I know uh, there was opportunity um, in, in June for the social time that I missed. So I'm filling um, that gap in connecting with everyone. So um, with that in mind, we do have some events coming up that I wanted to highlight uh, for potential opportunities to um, come together if there's interest in a social capacity. Um, so, um, might be a short turnaround, but this Saturday there's um, two pop-up events um, through our Summer Free For All program, um, one in the afternoon at Wellington Park and um, then later on at Seawall Crest Park. Um, so those are options I wanted to raise and then, um, but maybe more, more of a reasonable planning effort would be around um, attending the Paseo and um, just identifying a, a meeting location uh, and a time where we could um, come together somewhere along the park blocks and, and then either go together or, or separately, um, but just have some time where we can connect. So I wanted to, to see if there's interest and then help um, with proposing a meeting location if, if folks are interested in doing that. Thank you, Brooke. I love, I love having the option. Um, and I love, I love the idea. Um, you know, obviously August sometimes timing can be tricky, but if people are, you know, going to the parks events anyway and want to connect, I think it's a great idea. So maybe we'll, um, you know, soft RSVP to Brooke. And if people are interested, we can come up with ideas to uh, where to meet up and, and what time. Um, I see there's a couple of people in the chat who are saying that Paseo is definitely something that we want to try and do. So, And Brooke, do you mind being the uh, traffic cop on those, on anyone interested? Yeah, sure. Um, just let me know. Um, uh, it looks like there's mostly interest in Paseo. So maybe I'll work with Randy and his team to see if they have a suggestion for um, a good time and location as far as um, Maybe there's a performance or something we could all gather for that might be cool. Yeah, we're hopefully finalize, mostly finalizing the schedule um, at 1 p.m. meeting today. Um, and so I'll give you the inside scoop. <laughs> Thank you. Anything? Pester me, Brooke. <laughs> and feel free to pester me. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So anything anyone else has for the good of the order? If not, thank you. We are ending right on time. Thanks to a little shifting of the agenda. Um, and we will see you guys um, next month. Stay cool and attend your new potential working group meeting. Thank you.